Yes, good morning. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be here. I represent the International Geothermal Association. Most of you are members of national geothermal associations. So automatically, um, you are a member of the IGA, the International Geothermal Association. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much to the organizers for the invitation. Um, I will now, or let me first introduce you a bit to the IGA structures. We have committees which are focusing on information, on education, on the nominating procedures and other topics. That's our structure uh, with regards to our topics that we deal with. We are working together with 30 directors in our board of directors and these 30 directors come from all over the world. Currently, our board of directors consists of experts from New Zealand, from Australia, from the Philippines, Indonesia, China, Germany, Ethiopia, Kenya, and across to Latin America from El Salvador and from Mexico. So you see the wide range of the expertise that's available at the IGA. IGA is headquartered in Germany in a, a city called Bochum at the, at the moment. It's a former mining area of Germany. And with the headquarters position in Germany, we are focusing on, or we are also looking at, um, at district heating schemes, at, at the heat topic, besides the power production topic. Um, now, some of you might have seen some, some Latin American colleagues here mainly yesterday. And this is also a, a focus that the IGA is taking. We are working together with international organizations, and this is one of our, um, our mandates, actually. We, have, we currently have a project with the IFC in Turkey. IFC is the private sector branch of the World Bank. And we also have a project with IRENA, which is the International Renewable Energy Agency. They're based in Abu Dhabi, and they are initiating a new geothermal initiative in Latin America. And this is why you have seen some Latin American faces over the last many yesterday. I think most of them are leaving again today. So you see that we are actually going out into the countries and we are having a strong focus on applying and sharing our knowledge also with development partners. Um, and this was actually one of the backgrounds why we started this analysis. I will now inform you or share experiences with regards to policies, regulatory frameworks and best practices from five selected countries. Not all of them are that famous yet on the geothermal agenda, but they're famous, or they, in terms of my understanding and what we selected, we chose these countries because they, they're showing best practice in terms of policy institutional frameworks, feed and tariffs, renewable energy portfolios. That's why we chose these countries. And um, we did this study also to spread knowledge on policy development we, because we see that in many developing countries there's a lack in policy development and this is why investors are not coming, this is why development banks are very reluctant in investing in certain countries. Um, and this brief analysis is one step towards um, sharing our knowledge with new geothermal countries and, and, and aiming at um, improving their policy development. So I mainly <clears throat> look at the countries Germany, Kenya, New Zealand, the Philippines, and the US. Um, earlier, Jay Natawani, he was informing us extremely well about the US situation. So that part will be a bit quicker in my presentation now. <coughs> Some of you might know RAIN21. RAIN21 is an international policy body on the one side, they are um, they, um, sharing knowledge in terms of a report, which is the Global Status Report on Renewable Energies. It's published on an annual basis, and it looks at the different renewable energy sources. There's also one chapter on geothermal energy in it. And um, they've started, the, or in the initial chapters, they're also looking at the policy aspects, and they found out that policy targets exist in 118 countries in the world. And with policy targets, these are a bit softer. 
targets like roadmaps, for example, or um, the wish of a government to increase renewable energy shares. But they basically found out that these targets exist in 118 countries and, and power policies exist in 109 countries. Now, these are more, more solid. And here, about, um, when we talk about policies, we're talking about schemes, instruments like feed and tariff schemes or renewable energy portfolio standards. Earlier, we heard that in the US, for example, 29 federal states have implemented renewable energy portfolio standards now already. So there's a slow increase in, in the spread of policies or uh, uh, in the, in the, in the um, focus on, on power policies and the renewable energy business in more and more countries. Um, yeah, so I'll be speaking about incentive schemes, which does not only include financial in incentive schemes, but also policy incentive schemes like feed and tariffs and others, and privileges which are given to renewables instead of other, or, um, other re um, energy sources. These are the countries again that we are looking at, and I'll start straight away with Germany because it's the first in the alphabet. Um, the feed and tariff is um, known to most of you. It started in, in Germany. It was since adapted to many other countries. It basically gives a guarantee to investors, developers, and others um, in investing in renewables and in feeding it into the grid. In Germany, for example, the tariffs range between 3.5 euro cents per kilowatt hour for hydro plants, um, up to 43 euro cents for smaller solar power systems. So the govern government of Germany is putting a lot of money into, um, into the, the spread and into the development of renewables. With regards to geothermal, the government allocates 25 euro cents to geothermal plants for, pow for power um, production. Now, you, uh, you must know that the geological conditions in Germany n are not as good as in Iceland or other countries. So this is why the subsidy is quite high. For, this is the 25 euro cents is for plants up to 10 megawatts. And um, none of our plants at the moment exceed 10 megawatts. So it's all small scale. And um, the district heating and heating schemes in general are much more dominant in Germany. We also have a market incentive program which promotes geothermal. Um, so again, the government puts a lot of money into geothermal energy. And we are mainly, or one of the focus areas is the heating component. Um, heating is very important as we are, as Germany is also a cold country. Um, we have 13 district heating systems which are supported by geothermal energy at the moment. And we also have a new law since 2010 that 10% of the energy that one house or one public building gener uh, uses, that 10% of this has to be renewable now for all the houses that are newly built. So in order to um, achieve these 10%, every house owner now has to think about what shall I install? Shall I install a heat pump or shall I look at, at photovoltaic systems? What can I do? And for this scheme, uh, the German government adds, um, adds um, <coughs> financial resources um, for shallow geothermal, for example, subsidies um, are in place at the amount of 1,500 euros per residential unit. Also, loan schemes exist for drillings, for deep drillings, um, and for constructions and, and the expansion of power plants. On the right-hand side, you see our German parliamentary building, and it's heated and cooled with geothermal energy. On the lower part, you see some storage geothermal storage um, techniques of geothermal energy, which are used in Germany as well. Um, yeah. yeah, in terms of heat production, Germany is on the fifth position globally um, with regards to geothermal after the US, China, Sweden, and Norway. And um, of the shallow geothermal systems, we have about 165,000 applications installed in Germany. 
in the table, the table basically just shows you that we're talking about different deaths in Germany for, for geothermal drillings, different flow rates. Our highest temperatures in Germany are about 160 degrees, so it's quite similar, it's quite different to Icelandic conditions or other high enthalpy locations. But still, nevertheless, the German government is putting a lot of financial efforts and policy effort into geothermal energy. So just a highlight for Germany, which we found out is the feed and tariff system, the government subsidies, so the financial um, schemes that are in place in Germany, and the designation to geothermal energy. Now we're coming to the next country that we've un analyzed, and this is Kenya. I've also been working for the German Geological Survey before in a technical assistance program in the Eastern African Drift System. Um, and especially Kenya is one of the highlights, as most of you um, are likely to know. They have a very interesting, impressive roadmap with regards to geothermal. Up to 2030, they envisage to develop four gigawatt of geothermal power, and this is quite substantial, um, considering that that's some of the estimates for the whole East African Drift System are about nine gigawatts. So Kenya is putting quite a bit of effort into, into the geothermal <laughs> energy development um, in their country. In a 20-year period, they want to purchase 12 rigs. As far as I know, at the moment, they have about three drilling rigs. Um, so they intend to purchase many, many more. And what I want to highlight for Kenya is that even though they are not a developed country and they don't have that, that much um, financial means, they're still putting quite substantial funds into geothermal energy. And this is due to the reliability um, of geothermal energy and because it's, it's the most reliable and the cheapest option actually for Kenya. They've developed a least cost development plan in Kenya and they found out that geothermal is the most reliable and, um, and the cheapest option for the country. On the right-hand side, you see the geothermal sites along the East African Rift system in Kenya. Um, and what I also want to mention is that the development partners are playing a large role in terms of financing. The government of Kenya contributes about 400 million US dollars to geothermal, whereas the international development partners contribute um, 1.343 billion um, US dollars to to geothermal development. Yeah, and this is actually one of the highlights that want, I want to stress for Kenya, the, the importance of development partners, such as the EIB, the European Investment Bank, the German Development Bank, the KFW, the UNDP, the French um, Bank, so a lot of efforts are put into the country by development partners. And this is also a success story for Kenya because they've been able to convince development banks and development partners in, in, um, that they are strong and that they really want to set their targets to geothermal. So they've got their policies in place and they've had a geothermal act since 1982. Um, and they recently also um, changed the institutional setup of th in the country. Um, they transformed to, or they, there's two um, very important entities now, which is the GDC, the Geothermal Development Company, which is now um, in place for the first exploration drillings and for the surface studies. And then later on, it's been taken over by either IPPs or Kenjen or other operators. So there's also been an institutional transformation um, Phase that's been going on in in the country. So those are the highlights again for for Kenya. Um, institutional setup has been restructured, which is very successful at the moment. Then a lot of governmental funding, a lot of funding from the development partners, um, as well as the policies and the roadmaps that they have in place. This is quite strong. These are the highlights I want to make for, for Kenya. Looking at New Zealand, um, 
down here you see a map of, of New Zealand. The most geothermal developments are taking place in the northern, on the North Island. Um, geothermal energy was already used in, in the early days by the Maoris, and most of the uses are actually taking place on Maori lands. So the Maori people are very, very detrimental in the geothermal energy development because it's their property. Um, the first um, plant was installed in 1958, and now there's about 628 megawatts which are installed in New Zealand, mainly on the northern, on the northern um, island. Yeah, another fact that came up last year is that there is a moratorium now on thermal plants. So they really want to go renewables, and about 80% of the energy consumption now comes from renewables. Um, see it in the next slide. Um, and the, on the left-hand side, you see the, the um, energy, how it's used at the moment. Um, um, this is the, um, the, the yellow and the purple are the coal and the gas. That's the energy consumption at the moment, the generation, sorry. Um, and they want to move to 90% renewables by 2025. So over here you see that um, geothermal as well as hydro and wind are, are increasing substantially. Now, um, in terms of policy, um, New Zealand is also famous because of resource, its Resources Management Act, which was defined, and this actually brought together all the fuzzle and muzzle that was going on beforehand, because beforehand um, the policies were all intermingled between water policy and environment and mining, but now the Resource Management Act sorted this all out and, and um, and makes it very clear for developers in New Zealand to develop geothermal energy. It's a spot market in New Zealand. And um, yeah, and another point that I want to make is that um, capacity building has been quite important in New Zealand. Some of you might know GNS Science and the, the six month um, training program that um, that exists in New Zealand. This is quite crucial also for other development, developing countries. Many of the experts that I met in East Africa have gone through capacity building schemes in New Zealand. Going to the next country, going to the Philippines. The Philippines, are, they have uh, two gigawatts installed in, in their country and they've started shortly after the oil crisis, similar to um, Iceland. The oil crisis led them to, to develop their own indigenous resources and to put a focus on their own resources so that they wouldn't be so dependent anymore on foreign resources. And they've actually started quite interestingly um, because the government um, put a lot of effort into the exploration phase, into the surface studies and into the first initial stages of the test drilling as well. They especially formed a governmental body um, in the 1970s, which was the Philippine National Oil Company, an Energy Development Corporation, um, which is now uh, fully integrated, got privatized later on, EDC. Some of you might, might have heard of them. They're also doing a lot of international development work at the moment. And they have about 617 experts, 600 and 700 to 700 experts which are really dedicated to geothermal energy development and who are also going on overseas um, operations now. So here also is the same as in Kenya, the government is taking the initiative to develop the indigenous resources. Even though it's a developing country, still a lot of effort was put into geothermal, even though it's a very expensive, initially expensive business. Then, um, the Philippines are also quite interesting because of this, its policy framework. A lot of decrees were, were promoted and developed to promote geothermal energy. And also the, the whole government put a lot of fiscal incentives, financial incentives in place to, to really promote the sector. 
This is an overview of some of the most important decrees. They're also for renewable portfolio standards. Now, some of you might not know what this is. Renewable energy portfolio standards push, push the, the transmitters and the electricity generators to distribute a certain share of, their, of the whole electricity that they're distributing. A certain share of this must come from renewables. And earlier in the slide um, in the US, we saw the shares of 20% renewables for a federal state or 30% renewables for a federal state. And the Philippines, this also exists. Um, yeah, and then quite a number of um, other incentives for foreign investors coming to the Philippines. They were also supported with, with them being allowed to bring their own personnel and repatriating the capital to their, their home countries and so on. These are the decrees and proclamations proclamations that they've put, been putting in place. A lot of financial support schemes are in place in the Philippines as well, like loan guarantee programs, um, project preparation funds, and so on. Fiscal incentives, income tax holidays for the developments, duty-free import of machinery and equipment, and corporate taxes are um, quite low for foreign investors. So the Philippines, just to um, sum up again, they're quite, they're very, very good because of their policies. They have them in place, and because the government put a lot of initial effort into geothermal energy development, and then foreign and obviously the framework is also okay or good for foreign investment with the tax holidays and so on. So a lot of incentives from the government is is available in the Philippines. Now, briefly, one slide on the United States, because we heard a lot about the United States earlier. There's different schemes in place. Loan guarantee programs were in place. Um, a lot of effort went into the research at the gazes, for example, um, almost going that far that the gazes are, have depleted after some time. Renewable energy portfolio standards are in place in 29 federal states, we've heard earlier. A lot of incentives is going into EGS, into research, and so on. Yeah, just briefly on the United States. So also here we see a lot of government funds have gone into geothermal energy. Um, the United States are number one in terms of global generation of power with regards to geothermal. And now this is my final, my last slide. Um, as a conclusion, I just want to highlight again that the governments are very detrimental in geothermal energy development, the institutional framework that they set and the policy framework that, that, that they set is important for investors and developers. Feed and tariff systems are important. They provide guarantees, renewable energy portfolio standards, and set rules for power purchase agreements, because this is also not in place in some countries. Um, on Monday and Tuesday, some of you might have seen some Latin American faces. We've We've had a workshop on Monday and Tuesday also over here in Reykjavik where we're developing an, an, an initiative on geothermal in, in five Andean countries and there we've seen that the policy framework is just not in place and we really have to Im improve this. Roadmaps are, are important for in order to convince developers and others. Planning and monitoring tools are are important and we see as in Iceland the monitoring and planning and priority setting is excellent. Um, risk mitigation schemes, um, some of you might have heard the presentation on the geothermal resource risk mitigation fund which has been put in place in East Africa. So this is detrimental in the initial phases. Capacity building, over here we have the United Nations University with their geothermal training program. And this has done so much capacity building work, which is so important for the developing countries. I've met many colleagues that have been in Reykjavik and Iceland um, attending the UNIGTP program overseas. So it's, it's really crucial. And the institutional setup is, is detrimental as well as we've seen in the case of Kenya, for example. With this, I want to close. Downstairs, we also have a booth, but I'm also over here available for questions. So feel free to ask anything.